Okay, I think um, all of us who've been here all afternoon have had uh, an extraordinarily informative and uh, set of presentations and extremely good discussion. And I certainly, um, while Brexit is kind of new every day or at least new every week, uh, sometimes you feel you've sort of heard it all a bit before, but I certainly didn't feel I'd heard it all a bit before today. It was really, really excellent. So this final session um, is we've got, we've got, we've got uh, three speakers. The first is John McGrain, who's the Director General of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. And John set this up in, in, in 2011. And the surprise is that we hadn't had it 20, 30, or 40 years, years earlier. Yeah, well, certainly a long time earlier. And then no sooner had he set it up, and then we get Brexit, which is going in the opposite Maybe. direction. So somehow or other, I'm not doing cause and effect, but it, was, it, is, it is quite interesting that we, we actually had that. But it is quite interesting about our relationship in terms of the two islands, that that business commercial relationship had not developed, whereas it would have been true in a lot of other countries. Um, our next speaker we haven't properly met, although we've seen across the table, is uh, Jürgen Mathis, who's a head of research unit for international economics and economic outlook at the German Economic Institute in Cologne. Um, and then our third speaker is Liz McAreevy, who's CEO of the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce, so in some sense another part of, the, of, this, of, this, of this mechanism. So I'm going to ask John first to, to speak, and I think we've got a very nice passion going ahead of, of, of five minutes each, and then for the discussion. So John, do you Thank you, Francis. Ramila Margot, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and congratulations again to the Institute of International European Affairs on hosting yet another really high-grade conversation. Uh, so, uh, the organisation that I run is uh, a small but perfectly formed little body uh, concerned and obsessed indeed with just one thing, which is trade, the trade between the two islands, uh, north, south, east, west. For anybody new to the conversation, and there couldn't be anybody new to the conversation in this house, but just to remind ourselves, that's 65 billion in trade, both directions every year. It's 400,000 jobs directly, roughly evenly split on both islands, uh, and many, many hundreds of thousands more in the supply chain on both islands. Um, it, it does feel a little bit like deja vu, Francis. Um, have we all heard it all before? And it doesn't seem like that long since the day after, after the referendum. I stood here and I talked about our friends in the UK having taken back control of which foot to shoot themselves in and promptly shooting themselves in hours. And I've, I've cracked that bad gag too many times uh, over, the, over the two and a half years, but I haven't been arrested for it yet because actually our friends, most of them do get that joke that they too are bemused by what on earth has happened, but they're stuck and they cannot get out of that. I've just come back from spending the last four days at the Conservative Party conference in Birmingham working as... as uh, as hard as you can to try and figure out the unfigurable. Uh, the serious point I would relay right away is that uh, if we think that whatever is coming down the track in the next few weeks or longer is going to solve the problem, it won't. The, de the, de the depth and vitriol, I think was the word used earlier on, of division inside English society, and I choose those words carefully, is uh, I think almost unmendable at this stage, although there are great diplomats and former diplomats in the room who would say that is the purpose of diplomacy, to put Humpty back together again. But, but I, I was personally shocked this week more than ever to see the scale of division and the polarization. And it does make me fear that the risk has quite obviously gone up, but, but, but more re in more real terms than just polling, the, the difference in opinion inside British life, inside including British business life, and I'm, I'm shocked and somewhat ashamed to say that because business leaders are citizens as well, and in many cases, business leaders are 50-50 divided in their view of should, should the UK stay or leave, and, and that lies behind a lot of what's been happening. Business was extremely late to, to wake up and speak up, you know that, and really up until essentially Airbus, which was really only at about May, June this year, came out and said, you know, we are really in danger of walking over a cliff here. It was the first proper time a serious industry in the UK, CBI notwithstanding, Federation of Small Business notwithstanding, Chambers of Commerce notwithstanding, was the first time a serious business came out and said, this is trouble and it's going to happen. We are going to not employ the several tens of thousands of people that we employ in Britain, mostly in Wales, by the way, all of which Wales voted to leave, by the way, along with Cornwall, also funded 100% by the EU. You know all of those bad gags, but the serious point is Airbus started a flood that over the subsequent weeks we've seen several warnings from people like Jaguar Land Rover. I mean, Jaguar Land Rover in February said they were going to close one of their just three production lines in Halewood. So cut a third of their production capacity. A little bit about Dieselgate, but a, a lot about Brexit. And what did they announce the following day? Their newest actual investment in the future of autonomous 
digital driving design and automation, where did they say they would make that uh, investment? In Shannon, where you just need brains and broadband, and we've, well, we've got the brains, and please God, we'll get the broadband. <laughs> but like, you don't need heavy metal production uh, facilities to build autonomous research centers. And, and, and the serious point under all of this is that business has been late, but it is finally registering. So Jaguar have since moved to a three-day production week anyway, a little bit of Dieselgate, but a lot of Brexit uncertainty. BMW have said they will move the iconic mini brand out of Britain. All of Sunderland, we were there on the night in various establishments around this town watching for Sunderland to come in after the Hebrides in Gibraltar. We remember it well. Everybody in Sunderland voted to leave. 34,000 people in Sunderland work for Nissan and its supply chain, and 80% of what Nissan does depends on open links to the European Union. All of that was lost until recently, and we say now, or I say now, that Mrs. May, and I watched her this week, she's between a hard Brexit and a hard border. And the hard Brexit piece has finally registered. We've been talking about the hard border since 15 December when I and my team were in Brussels last year for the day of the backstop. And, and we know all about that and its various reiterations. But the, the hard Brexit piece is the piece that's finally come onto the table. And it is the reason, in my personal view, why the middle shall hold. Uh, the only thing business in, in Britain, that was touched on earlier on, fears more than Brexit is Jeremy Corbyn. And the only thing that's keeping the... Uh, Brexiteers from mauling Mrs. May, and she survived, is the, the realisation that Corbyn just could get into power and they could lose. So you've got, in my, in my view, and it's an entirely personal view, a momentum, bad word in this case, probably in the Labour context, that is basically binding the centre together and enabling Mrs. May to have survived in Birmingham and to do what we all needed her to do, was to not fall off the horse. Mrs. May is brilliant at not falling off the horse. She is control personified and she remains in control. So the next few weeks, please God, she has the space to actually get back to work. One of the privileges of being involved in the policy formation work and the, uh, the business connectivity that the British Irish Chamber does is we get to meet some really high-grade public servants on this island, on the other island, and in Europe. And we have the height of regard for what our civil servants and our politicians and, and the risks that they take every day, and they get no applause for that. We need them to be given the space to do the work that now remains in the, in the space between the cauldron of Birmingham and the resolution, hopefully, of mid-November in Brussels at 3 a.m. in the morning and all the theatre that Europe loves to do with all of that. But if it, if it leads to the typical European result and the smoke clears and we get a Habemus Papam and we have a deal. We think that the failure to win a deal is actually Armageddon. I, I know there was somebody, I was in the back, but somebody spoke earlier on to say it's not Armageddon. Uh, the, I won't even begin to bore you with the list of business model collapses. This morning I did some work with one of Ireland's largest retailers who are telling their suppliers that they expect every single one of them to have those chilled goods on the shelf at 10 past 8 every morning per contract or they will not renew their contracts. So that's all a little bit almost uh, bullying, but we're seeing the same in the UK. And what's happening is the supply chain backup in behind the conduct of everyday business for food and goods and everything else is going to be absolutely thrown into disarray. The ports have absolutely no capability to do that. Apologies to anybody running ports, but it's not about the port people. There is no planned land around the Irish ports. Cork and Ross in particular I'm thinking about. Dublin will be fine, but the M50 won't because the trucks will simply back up onto the arterial routes. And that's just here. In Britain, it's that to the times of, of exponential. So it is Armageddon, and we spend all of our time now working with politicians to help them to understand the implications of the decisions that they're making and the arcane you know, terminology of WTO and 72% uh, tariffs on beef and all that. And we respect that they weren't elected for their trade organization prowess. They are public representatives. It's very important in advocacy, and including the IIA, that we help public servants to understand the implications. We think a deal will be crafted, but that's only the first step. It's the, the fudged words, the word smithing that's going on around the clock now, and we respect that process so that the same words can mean different things to different people in a month's time. The work only starts then. The first thing we need is a much extended transition period. You know, 21 months to 20, the end of 2020 wouldn't do anything. And uh, 
the process will need to be extended almost indefinitely to allow for the crafting of a full-up future trade deal that lastly, critically, must do the thing that even checkers didn't put into the mix. Like in, in, in Birmingham this week, people were criticizing Mrs. May for saying chuck checkers, like say, they were saying chuck checkers, it's not good enough. In Europe, checkers wouldn't have been agreed anyway, because for many, many reasons, but not least because it doesn't acknowledge services. And for all of us who understand the goods and, and, and trade we do every day, we know that there's no goods without services anymore. Mrs. May borrowed our line on Andrew Marsh. She said it's not just about importing the photocopier from Italy, it's about allowing the engineer to travel six months later to give it a, a good thump in the middle of, of, uh, of Huddersfield when it breaks down. So that's services and goods combined. We think that over the next few weeks, and we hope a deal will be found, we think the business needs to be out front and airing its point of view, and it's, it's better late than never, and we take our hats off to the people who have to do the toughest work, which is our public representatives and officials. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much as well for the invitation to... Um, the hosts of, the, um, of this event to Adenauer Stiftung and, and the other institutes. Um, great, great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm um, Jürgen Matos from the Cologne, um, German Economic Institute. We are the largest privately funded think tank in, in Germany um, and I had the international team as you heard. And um, we, I will speak to you about um, the um, macroeconomic impacts of Brexit like you. Both of you have more of the business um, aspect and I bring bring in the the macroeconomic aspect and I will frame it um, um, in the question that before the referendum um, you had these quotes by Michael Gove and, and and Boris Johnson that there will be great opportunities there will be a soft Brexit and everything will be fine and global Britain will be great and full of opportunities um, Michael Gove we ha we will hold all the cards so um, we we did a um, so what what is really um, in there. Um, and what, is, what, is, what can we say as economists um, as far as the long-term and the short-term um, impact of Brexit is concerned? We did a study shortly before the referendum on the, um, on the long-term impact. So if Brexit comes, obviously this depends on the scenario. Is it hard Brexit or soft Brexit? Um, we didn't do our own calculations, but we did a meta study. And I think it was very, very striking that before the... Um, um, the referendum you had basically results between plus 10% by Brexit of Patrick Minford and the economists for Brexit mm. and pr about tw plus uh, minus 20% um, which would be lost because it, EU integration would bring as much as, as that some calculations may be not perfectly robust. So it's a, a huge spectrum. We looked deeper and, and found that basically if you, if you do right calculations and fa uh, put in the pros and cons of Brexit, um, you get to a clear negative impact. But most of the studies basically said, well, it's only in the single digit, low single digit area, two, three, four percentage points over 10, 15 years. And this is little. And it, it, it enabled the Brexiteers to say, well, we take back control, and the economy doesn't matter. And this was difficult. And we, like, and we as economists thought, well, what are we talking about with all the globalization and, and since David Ricardo and, and Adam Smith? There must be more in. And so we looked deeper into these, these studies and found that basically um, the, the models that are really reliable, they are unfortunately still unable to get in all the positive aspects of economic integration. So they are a, just come out with too, too few or too, too low results. So we try to, to, to figure out with different methods where the re results could be and um, came out with a kind of warning with, that said basically in a, in a hard Brexit scenario, you could easily um, come to the 10% digit um, change. And this obviously matters. This would cost jobs. Um, but again, this is an, um, a calculation which is, very difficult to do. What we now are able um, to do is to look at the short-term impact since the referendum, basically. The only two aspects that we have, basically, is um, the um, devaluation of the British pound and uncertainty. And uncertainty, obviously, rising was just what you, what you mentioned and what we had before because of the danger of a no-deal scenario. Um, the um, um, devaluation of the British pound um, made exports of the UK um, a bit cheaper, but it didn't really um, help a lot. Um, and um, by the way, it 
made German exports to the UK um, obviously more expensive, and we did a calculation um, that basically came out that, basically, that if the pound devaluates by um, 10 percent, you could um, uh, expect a decline in German merchandise exports to the UK by about 6 percent. And this was basically, um, and it, 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 as there was a devaluation of a bit more than 10 percent, you, you then really saw in the second half of 2016, so the six months after the referendum, a decline of German exports to the UK by 7%, which was a lot because exports to, to, to the UK grew um, by 5 to 10% in the years before. So there was a, a good bit of, of change. Um, so what, what was, again, helping um, the Brexiteers in their argument, argumentation was that many studies that came out before the referendum said, well, if there is a pro-Brexit referendum, you will have a recession, basically, shortly afterwards. That didn't happen. Um, the business cycle indicators went down immediately, but they went up again. So really, basically, the growth momentum was maintained, but this was mainly because private consumption in, in the UK was very, very dynamic, and it, and it stayed like that. And the labor, mar uh, the labor market also was very positive. What we see now, time after time, is the effects of uncertainty and the effects of the um, um, pound devaluation, and they are a drag on growth. The UK economy grew before the referendum by 2.2 to 2.5 percent, something like that, on average in the years before. So very solid. What is now the case is that, and, and they grew much faster than the euro area. Now it's the opposite way. So now the euro area grows faster and, and um, the UK grows, um, grows less dynamically. Um, about 1.5% only. Why? Because of the impact of the devaluation, because the devaluation made imports more expensive. This, made, this led to an increase of, of inflation. And as nominal wages grew about the same, real wages declined. So consumption growth, which was about 3% a year, came down to 1.5%. And this was an important drag because private consumption is a huge part of GDP. Of, of, um, of growth. And also private um, investment, you see, is declining a lot. What is most striking to us is um, that also investment from abroad to the UK is declining. From 2000 to 2016, so long-term average, um, FDI inflows, so foreign direct investment inflows to the UK, were by far the largest um, among EU, EU member states. By far, really. And in, two, in the last year, um, the UK was only fifth or sixth. So it declined from 65 billion a year on average to 15 billion. So this is again a manifestation of the uncertainty. And it's important to, to see um, that uh, UK will, and this will probably go on into the future, um, because the UK will lose um, the, um, the function as a bridgehead for international companies that go to the UK and then serve um, because of language and because of a relatively free market and that serve from the UK, from the, from the, UK, um, the EU, um, the EU market. And this will no longer be possible if we um, don't get a very soft Brexit. So that is, that this is what we see, a decline in, in growth for different reasons and a loss of attractiveness as, a, as an investment location. And I think this, this is important to note. However, um, even with a growth rate of 1.5%, where we are now, and, and most projections are staying for the next few years around this, um, around this digit, um, this will um, not lead to much unemployment. The labor market is pretty strong. So the question is, will the people realize that Brexit is really a drag on their economy? Maybe not. And this is obviously not, or if you talk about a second referendum, obviously, if people don't feel um, the damage, um, they won't change their minds. Well, they, they, well, they know, well, the economy might not grow as dynamically as before, um, but they, um, they don't know that it could have grown by 2.5%. Now it grows by 1.5%, and if they don't lose their job, well, um, nothing changed so very much. I think the last words is again on the bit of outlook on the future and again connected um, to this bridgehead um, argumentation. Um, I think when um, Theresa May in 
Birmingham came on, the, on, the, on stage. She did this dance because she, before she um, was, that was dancing in Kenya. Um, and this kind of leads back to what, what we heard from others um, is that the UK cannot defy gravity, which means, but gravity now in a, in a, in a trade sense, um, that means if you, if you lose or like if you try to describe how intensively you, you, you trade with any, any partner near or far away, you can describe it with, with the uh, gravity um, theory, basically. The larger the partner and the larger you are, the more you trade. The nearer the partner, um, you, the more you trade. And the farther away, the less you trade, obviously. So if you, as in the UK, lose a partner that is very near to you and is very big, you are just unable to substitute for that with any partner that is small and far away. So Theresa May can dance as much as she wants. She won't really solve this problem that she cannot defy gravity. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm sure it's kind of the, this is the graveyard slot, as they say, uh, last speaker of the, of the day. Uh, it's been fast. Actually, the good thing about coming last is it's been a fascinating afternoon listening to the speakers. Um, if somewhat uh, a bit depressing to finish up a Friday afternoon with the realisation that actually um, I don't think businesses in general are as well informed about the issues as the people in this room. And I think from a Scottish perspective, um, the landscape doesn't help particularly. 99% of businesses in Scotland are SME. Um, so, you know, I, I think they are definitely unprepared for what's uh, coming down the, ro the road. Um, but I'm delighted to join the conversation and, and offer a bit of a, a business perspective. Um, I think that so far we've focused on the political issues and the process of us um, exiting the EU. Um, but I think uh, it's the great uncertainty um, that's following uh, and how this is going to impact the economy, that, that it's at the, the forefront of what businesses are grappling with at the moment. For business, it's all about the economy, um, particularly trade and labour, uh, because without this, there is no economy. Um, and yet the dichotomy is that Brexit has never been about the economy. It's always been about sovereignty, communities and emotion. Uh, we've been talking to a number of pollsters who are continually um, testing uh, the temperature of um, businesses and, and citizens who decided to uh, leave. And whilst they say, do you realise that you will be paying higher taxes, that you will have less money in your pocket, that there may be less public services, that um, money put into the pension pots could be less. You're going to have a much harder time over the next five to ten years. And they go, yes, we understand that. We would still vote the same. And I think that's the challenge we've got. Um, from a trade and labour perspective, what is in place now works very well. And it's hard to see how anything else can come close to what we have. But I think businesses believe that they're resilient. And I think um, with the promises that there are um, limitless opportunities ahead, I think businesses feel that they will overcome and that they will make the best of, of what they have to do. Um, it was, it's interesting, um, immediately post-Brexit, we set up a, a business Brexit group. And I think there was sort of mild panic in the business community at the time. And we kind of gleaned that the top five issues were access to a single market, access to migrant workers, regulatory stability, um, concern about continued EU funding, and a stable tax regime. About a year later, uh, we disbanded the group because of sheer boredom of uh, the discussion, and there was actually nothing, nothing to discuss. But what did transpire in that 12 months was that actually the, the focus had turned to social cohesion uh, and the concern about uncertainty. And I think uncertainty has been the mantra of business ever since. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of just going to give you a little bit of the kind of Scottish dynamics going on. Um, timing's really good because British Chambers of Commerce conducted a Brexit survey over the summer. Um, so about two and a half thousand um, businesses responded to a number of questions on Brexit. Um, about 250 of those were from Scotland. And so we've been able to cut it from a, a Scottish perspective. So hot off the press, I'll be able to share with you um, the response to that survey. And then I'll kind of just sum up where I think business is uh, right now. 
So I think, you know, as, as um, Alexandra said, um, the vast majority of Scots voted to remain. And as John said, we are stuck with it and we will be exiting the EU with the rest of the UK, whether we like it or not. Um, the Scottish First Minister has called for delays in exiting the EU if there's a no deal. And whilst this does create constitutional tension, it is supported by the vast majority of Scottish businesses. And I think uncertainty is the enemy here. Scotland has a significantly higher proportion of fisheries and farming and has had more use of EU structural funds. Um, so they need a lot more clarity on, on how this is going to be managed going forward. Migration. As we heard from Eve, I think migration is probably the biggest concern. And actually, for me now, having listened to Eve speak this afternoon, I think uh, there's a job to be done. Um, we are heavily reliant on migrant workers in Scotland. Tourism, education, agriculture, fisheries, these are all sectors that are heavily reliant on migrant workers. In fact, I'm um, speaking to someone in the hotel um, sector recently saying as much as 70 to 80% of their workforce are filled by European, mainland European workers. Um, and actually, I personally feel sad that in an age of working towards an inclusive economy, we are defining citizens' values um, to our communities by defining them in terms of high skill and low skill, that their monetary contribution to society is, um, is how they're being judged, deeming people only fit to be part of British society if they earn a particular level of income. Not where I thought we'd be in 21st century Britain, I have to say. Um, and also, I think um, freedom of movement is two-way traffic. Um, how are businesses going to um, move people into, tra you know, transfer into new jobs, you know, particularly global companies who want to move them into European headquarters? How are business travellers going to be, um, you know, in disrupted by this? So I, th I think there's a, a, a huge amount of issues to deal with. Um, we also need to trade. As a country, we need to trade uh, and trade internationally to support our economy. We have a, a huge productivity challenge. Um, and fewer businesses with a global mindset. And, and the two complement each other well. Um, I think businesses who trade internationally tend to be more productive. Um, so we need to make international trade easier with fewer, not greater barriers and cost. And, and Scotland um, actually is world leading in data-driven innovation. Um, the University of Edinburgh is top three in the world uh, for data-driven innovation. Edinburgh set itself the ambition of being the data capital of Europe. Um, it's committed to developing 100,000 digitally skilled people um, for the Scottish economy over the next five years. Uh, and that, you know, particularly around developing sectors like fintech, um, has huge opportunity for the Scottish economy. And yet there's so much uncertainty around the transport, uh, transfer of data across jurisdictions and how do we continue to attract investment. We'll have a skilled pool of you know, digitally skilled people and yet we won't be able to attract um, the investment in to take advantage of that. And if we kind of um, just reflect on um, this Brexit survey, as I say, 2,500 respondents, about half um, import-export will consider themselves part of an international supply chain. Um, key findings. Um, uncertainty over Brexit is the most prevalent factor when considering import-export decisions. Uh, at 53% of businesses, this is larger than their concern over exchange rate volatility or even their own financial position. 40% uh, of the sample are engaging with direct trade with Ireland, but over half of these um, have not taken any preparatory action with regard to potential customs um, or border issues. About 10% of businesses are considering their current supplier arrangements. Most significantly, over two-thirds of firms have not yet engaged in any risk assessment or preparatory planning on Brexit, uh, which kind of makes me concerned that there's a big pile of problems um, coming down the highway. Um, about a fifth of businesses reported a change in the number of EU workers um, they, they employ. But interestingly, the majority of businesses are not expressing any impact on their businesses in the past 12 months. Um, in the change uh, of EU workers, 94% reported a drop in the number of EU workers that they're employing, uh, which is even more concerning in light of the continued skill shortages and the government's plan to significantly cut back low-skilled and um, migrant workers from the EU and the rest of the world. Concern for the wider economy um, in the result of a no-Brexit deal would see 82% um, of businesses looking to cut recruitment and investment. 
Um, but a status quo transition period um, results in businesses saying they're less likely to change their existing plans. Um, if a deal can't be reached in the time frame, most businesses believe that the UK should look to extend the Article 50 period um, and conduct further negotiations. Interestingly, though, a substantial minority, 20%, would prefer the government to move forward with no deal. Um, and regardless of the final outcome, the majority of the sample believe that trade with the EU should be the government's focus in the medium term, um, with 25% believing that um, trade with countries outside the EU should be the priority. So I guess, just summing up, um, I've certainly got huge concerns having listened to the discussion today. Um, uncertainty around Brexit is the key driver affecting import-export decisions. Lack of preparatory and contingency planning is a real issue. Um, and I do, uh, BCC have produced um, a risk register, which we are working through with businesses. I think there's one, I think out of the 24 issues on the register, there's one green, um, which is, I think, um, VAT. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, a no deal option will have a substantive impact on recruitment and investment plans across Scotland, uh, mostly in a negative direction. Um, businesses are telling us that a status quo transition would be more positive out outcome and would provide little disruption. Um, and if a deal can't be reached, as I say, um, they would much prefer um, to extend negotiations. Um, I think the overall, the results are broadly in line with the rest of the UK, um, but our lack of contingency planning in Scotland is about 5% higher than the rest of the UK. 67% in Scotland, 62% in the rest of the UK. Um, so I would say uncertainty and a bit of inertia <laughs> would be a description of where we are um, overall. But as you kind of mentioned earlier, it's hard to say where we might be if we haven't had this hanging over our heads for the last um, two years. Um, but as always, um, I think businesses are resilient and I think that they will make the best of it. Thank you. Okay, we've time for a few questions. Um, and uh, let's get that ball rolling. I saw a hand up here at the left, at the back. If you could, yeah. Just, just here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Donald Denham again. Uh, I'm sorry to say, John, I'm the person who mentioned Armageddon. Armageddon. I yeah. said there wouldn't be an Armageddon. Yep. Uh, I have to say, I found your analysis interesting, but uh, I would go a little bit further and say that business hasn't just been late, it hasn't been at the table at all. It's been delinquent oh. in, in put, putting <laughs> forward arguments against Brexit. Within three weeks of the referendum in 2016, Nissan came out and said they would continue to yes. employ yes. everybody yes. in Sunderland. That's correct. That's correct. I mean, how can you explain that? Uh, I'm also concerned that rejecting, uh, uh, as we did very summarily on the EU side, the checkers' proposals, inadequate and all as they may have been, we have actually given ammunition to that Tory tough, Jacob rees mogg and his cohort of extreme Brexiteers, and weakening the government in London does not help find a solution to Brexit. Okay, great. John, do you want to take that? Do you want to take, you take that? Yeah, take, well, I think let's take a couple. There's one over here as well. John, this here. Thank you very much, <coughs> Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> from an aviation industry point of view, we're almost at crisis point already. I mean, uh, talking about the lead-in time, um, and this is one of the few occasions that I agree with. Can you speak up a little bit, Tom? It's not carrying. Uh, this is one of the few uh, occasions where I agree with Michael O'Leary. Um, but w one of the things that strikes me about the UK business sector, uh, from my own context, mm. is that both the Remainers and the Brexiteers have a firm belief in British exceptionalism. And that, therefore, that the EU will have to reach an agreement with Britain. And I guarantee you that the 62% who have contingency plans, are they, those contingency plans, with possibly 5% of them, will actually be serious. Most of them won't even begin to address the consequences of a, a okay. crash-out Brexit. Okay. 
So can we take those two points? Do you want to start, John? Yeah, I might uh, take the, the introductory point about uh, business being delinquent. I, I, I happen to agree. I, for, those, for businesses who didn't speak out, I hold no torch for them. Uh, we've been speaking. We spoke on the day after the referendum here, and uh, uh, shortly after that, we commissioned a massive piece of work with businesses here and in the UK, and we developed answers, not questions, under the form of uh, my colleague Katie Dohan's publication, um, "Big Principles for a Strong uh, Brexit uh, Relationship Going Forward." And uh, we've trailed that all around Westminster, uh, Dublin for sure, and Brussels, and it it is emerging as. Um, shall we say, the proposition closest to what might succeed. So I won't bore you with the detail, it's a customs arrangement with a comprehensive solution on services and all the accoutrements that a proper custom solution is going to require. Um, businesses um, are on, on preparation. Business people, um, particularly SMEs, and, and uh, Liz is quite right, I mean the majority of firms are small firms, and the majority of all small firms are optimists, because they have to be, because the alternative would mean that they wouldn't be in business in the first place. There are so many risks that they have to take every day. Uh, and their optimism includes saying, it'll be all right on the night, even if it won't. And their pragmatism says, tell me, when I need to, tell me what I need to know when you know what I need to know. And you can't tell me that today. And I've only got two and six in the bank. And I can't go around spending my finite resources on a lot of different plans that may never come to fruition. And most of them are so small that they're actually they're, they're in better place than mid-scale businesses. Yeah. Global businesses have the resources. Mid-scale Irish and British firms the that trade too. substantially are too big to turn on a dime and too small to have the resources for all the outcomes. And they're the worry space right now. Yeah. Jürgen. Yeah, I, I just wonder whether um, business might not have sp spoken out very loudly in the UK, but um, just from as an outsider um, looking at, at, the, at the movement of, of, the, of, of Theresa May, um, putting checkers on the table and moving towards now towards customs union is a clear indication for me that obviously there had been intensive talks with business behind the scenes, <laughs> <in> <laughs> behind closed doors. Yes. Otherwise, she wouldn't have moved in this direction. Yeah. So going to your point about um, the aviation industry, I think um, Open Skies, big concern. I was at an um, aviation authority uh, roundtable recently, and I think um, the, the view that there's going to be a cut and paste job of all the uh, bilateral agreements, and that it will just be done. Um, I think there's a, a realization that there's a lot of technical detail in these, and getting it done in the time frame um, could well be a challenge if there's a small technicality that's forgotten or a mistake that's made. So I, I think that um, a little bit more pressure is being stepped up. Um, so, well, quick point on this. Yeah, um, bilaterals, uh, I couldn't believe that the British government came out. Sorry, Tom, just wait for the mission. Sorry. Yeah. I couldn't believe that the British government came out saying that they would do bilateral deals. You can't do a bilateral deal with the EU. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's nonsense. Yeah. Uh, Alan Duke's here. Point, Duke's I think that's the point about yeah. um, the re rebuttal of, of checkers. I, I, I didn't see it as, so, as uh, quite that. They, uh, in a barely reported comment, Mr. Uh, Michel Barnier said three days after. So he let the white paper settle for three days. And then he said on the Friday, if the, we welcome at least something, which it was. And he said, if the UK can show flexibility, the EU will as well. And in the subsequent weeks, we saw what that looked like. It was the checks and controls on the British mainland into Northern Ireland and possibly further. And, and really at a level that was quite accommodating. It didn't survive, but it, it showed a flexibility that I didn't expect to see. Alan Jukes, yeah. So Alan Jukes, um, the, the Brexit argument, the pro-Brexit argument, is about getting back control uh, and partly about getting out from under what are seen to be overly constraining EU regulations. Hmm. The pro-Brexit people have recently been talking about, okay, we can join the WTO, which incidentally, they don't say, is another organization that has externally decided rules. The one thing that has puzzled me throughout this whole argument about British industry is how nobody has come up with any coherent expression of why it might be in British industry's interests to depart from European regulations. I made this point um, in Beijing last year, asking, you know, what might be the reason for UK industry to want to depart from these regulations? And I gave the example of Rolls-Royce, which makes, successfully makes aero engines that conform to all international standards. There's absolutely no interest for that company in departing from externally applied rules and standards. They're successful because they, they're good at uh, adhering to those. Why is nobody in British industry ever saying, uh, making that point, 
The okay. reason these regulations are there are to facilitate trade, not, yeah. not to one more suppress comment. it. No, I, think, I think you've made a very good point on but just to, and, we, and we'll get the three of you just to come in on that one, because I think, I think it's, a really, it's a really striking point, and I have a personal view on it myself I'll come back to. Yeah, final Thank question. You. Uh, Jim Nugent from AIB. Uh, I have a question for Jürgen in terms of his, um, his statement about the German-UK um, uh, trading links and the sensitivity of models. That you reckon that the, the estimates were, were undercooked? Um, I'm, I'm just a bit sort of concerned, and uh, what, what struck me is that the Department of Finance's uh, recent uh, study that used uh, Copenhagen e economics uh, as their provider for, for the estimates of, br of Brexit-related uh, shortfalls in, in trade, uh, et cetera. Would you, would you share s similar concerns about the, the estimates for, for uh, the effects of is, Brexit? Is, is the Copenhagen School's um, computable general equilibrium models, which have, been, which have been used by Ireland to look at the trade effects? Yeah. That they're, they're, they're similarly underestimating the effects of Brexit. We'll call it underestimation rather, under, rather than undercooked, given what cooking the books normally sounds like. So, Jürgen, do you want to start into that and then we'll come back to the other, the other two? Um, I don't know this, this, this particular study, um, but um, if it uses normal models, as the Copenhagen economics model usually does, and if they don't add anything around, um, then it would, or our criticism would apply mm -hmm. as well to that, as well to the uh, model of LSE and, 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 and of Felbermeier and, and all the others. Economists are just unable to, to in, in include all the, all the positive um, effects, I think. Um, so the, would, it, would another way of saying it, they're generally <laughs> minimum estimates uh, because they're not dynamic. They're more static models based on data over a period of time, and that doesn't really map out. So you have to see them as a minimum. And basically, what, when you look at free trade agreements and you have ex, post, uh, ex ante mm -hmm. um, uh, estimations of trade effects, they are much, small, much smaller than ex post when you look at the, da at the data. This is another indication for us that they are severe on the estimation. But I would also like briefly say something on, 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 yeah. on the rules and, 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 and regulation standards issue. Um, I think um, there must or there is this very strong interest on, in, in, an interest on both sides of, 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 um, um, of, of, the, of the channel um, and obviously all on, on the Irish Sea um, to, to keep the same product standards. So it's basically what, what Checkers um, um, uh, puts, puts into the window um, because this is basically to avoid um, or to, to make it clear to everybody to, it's important to, um, not to have the same thing as we have with the US. And mm -hmm. what we wanted by, with TTIP to, to get rid of, that yeah. you buy a Forby Golf, Volkswagen Golf in, in Wolfsburg, and if, it were, if it's to be exported to the US, you have to open it up again and, and introduce an, yeah. other mirrors and, and, and whatever. So it, it incurs a lot of costs, and then you have to test it twice. <laughs> again, not, a lot of costs. If you have the same standards on both sides, same your regulations, yeah. you only have one product, be sold in both markets and only one test. And this is um, what is essentially, and I think, in my view, the EU could be a bit more open to, to this approach. It, it, I think the EU has, we've all taken a bit for granted the, the, what this single market brought, which was this commonality of standards, which reduces production costs, which streamlines things, and is particularly beneficial, I think, to what you were talking about, John, the medium-sized enterprises mm. who are engaged in, in value chains. The small ones mm. sometimes are not as much. But the medium ones gain because they, don't, they can't run multiple um, product lines, Various. which they have to do if they're going to export into mm. different markets. John, do you want to come yeah, back to that? On the data point, first of all, uh, Mark Carney was with us a couple of weeks back, and he said that on average, you know, uh, the, the gap in real wages mm. is at a manageable level in the UK, and therefore the consumer is fine. If your head is in the fire and your feet are in the fridge, then mm. on average you feel fine. Yeah. The problem is that there are extremities, and outside London, outside the London bubble, and, and in, in some parts of, of England and the regions actually, there are extremes of poverty emerging now yeah. because real wages are falling deeply behind and if you talk to food retailers, they'll tell yeah. you exactly who's spending what and it's not good. On the piece about rulemaking, global businesses, motor manufacturers, aviation, big pharma, they like rules that are the same. Small businesses, their perspective is totally different. I spoke to a, a fishmonger last week, a very good fishmonger. He sells smoked salmon, very good smoked salmon, in a transparent plastic pouch. And he was told he has to change the label to add on a new sticker that says contains fish. 
<laughs> and that's the Ministry of Silly Rules. The problem is, yeah. he didn't realise that that's a locally made rule in England. Yeah. It's not actually what the EU so, asked him yeah. to do. So you, those are the complications of the message. That's the, pr the, the press that got into that, that all these, that all these nasty rules all came from one place. Yeah. Liz, final yeah, word. I, I think the issue as well is um, you know, we definitely need that kind of common uh, regu uh, regulation because, you know, how do we legislate for products that are tested in the UK? Um, will they be accepted in the EU? And what do we do about dispute resolution as well? So I think that these are issues that have not been addressed um, whatsoever. Um, and I think going back to that, uh, you, know, you know, the rules of, of silliness, um, you know, whiskey and salmon, biggest um, exporter for in the UK, not just yeah. Scotland. The interesting fact is something like six bottles of whiskey per second is exported from Scotland. And, uh, you know, when you're negotiating free trade agreements, uh, you've got issues around maturation periods and, and all kinds of issues. So, I, you know, it's, it's absolutely critical um, that we have that. So I want to, to wrap this, this up and just make just a couple of general points. I suppose from, from the, one of the things that has come out, I think, which we all know, but it's, it's interesting how it's like with this Brexit thing, you kind of realise something, you, some other bit of the jigsaw, edge bit of the jigsaw sort of fits into place. This was a kind of political social decision with enormous economic implications. And I suppose that's what this final session is, just teasing out what some of those economic implications were, even though they came up under the other, other sessions later. And I think that, that, that you know, certainly yes, I think this struck me in the, in the debate as it was ahead of, ahead of Brexit, because uh, I couldn't believe this could possibly happen, I have to say. I would, I would have lost money if I, if I was a betting woman, but I, I, I did, I'm not, so I didn't. But, but what, I, what struck me was that Irish industry knows the language of politics, partly because of the history of the last 30 or 40 years. So when they always talk about a change or an effect, they immediately move to jobs. That's not been the British way. The British way is we talk about our export sales, our global performance, our this, this, that, and the other. So by getting it into jobs, voters have an, a connection here immediately with it. So they just, you know, if you say it's going to reduce my export sales by 10%, first of all, do I understand what 10% means? Second, what's an export sale? I don't really think in those terms. So in terms of the connectedness between business and Europe and politics, I think Ireland, because for, you know, for lots of reasons, and in fact in many of our um, past referendums, we've had business out there very actively yes, doing yes. it. But business already had that language. And as an economist, I'd say, well, actually, they're out there making exports, and along the way, they're, make, they're creating jobs. But the reality is, if you're trying to join up the society and the politics and the economics, jobs is the absolutely crucial thing. Jobs and wages. And of course, what you're having in the UK now is declines in real wages yep. because, because prices have risen. Yep. And I think it's a, an interesting piece that I think the probably effect created at the time was, as soon as Brexit happened, you know, Armageddon, Armageddon, the dreaded Armageddon would happen the following day. And of course, you know, for those who wanted to leave, they we discovered the following day they hadn't actually left. And for others, the, what was projected as the problems are going to be much longer term. And it seems to me there's a danger that, I think you talked, John, about the short and the long term. In the short term, because people are spending money to actually deal with Brexit, that gives a boost to growth, it gives certain kinds of investment. In other words, spending you, borrowed money. They're spending, spending, no, they're, borrowing, they're, they're, they're borrowing money, but, but, but so there's an investment going on, and that can actually mean that the longer term growth <coughs> is actually more depressed, that yes. there's a shorter term, there's an evaluation effect, but on top of that, there's another kind of effect that's probably very short term. Somebody said to me recently, which I think um, bears worth repeating, um, the UK left on an emotional basis. It wasn't any way rational, as we know, the rational fact, the figures and the facts weren't out there. It was a thing about sovereignty, forgetting that in a globalised world, sovereignty has evolved and changed in what it is. They left to this emotional thing, we have lost our sovereignty, we've lost our control. This person who's an economic psychologist said to me, if you, if you make a decision on an emotional basis, you won't remake a decision on a rational basis. So what that means is that the only way to change the emotional decision, if you were ever to change it, is that you can translate the rational evidence into a new narrative, which has emotional appeal. So even though all of the data that came out after the event came out and you know, should have, should have, you'd have thought as an economist, a rational economist, I'd have thought this would have made a big change. Of course it didn't, because unless you could get the, 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 the whole thing reworked into a new emotional narrative, it's not going to have that effect. Anyway, I've had my little spiel at the end of the afternoon, so I'm going to let you all home and, 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 and thank the speakers for a fantastic afternoon. Thank the, the IIEA people who were involved in organising this, particularly Andrew, wherever you are in the room. Uh, but it was a fantastic afternoon and an event well worth having. And I think having the German perspective, along with the Scottish and the Irish one, just gave that a kind of a unique flavour.
um, to see exactly where the, the three large pieces fit together. Because Scotland and Ireland are the small countries, Germany and the UK are the big countries. So we small and big countries have to sort of work together. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.